World News Tonight. Debt debates. The Republicans offer Democrats a short-term solution to an ailing economy. Aiding abortion. The United States backs bodily autonomy as abortion laws take a hit. Possible cures. Africa fights one of the world's deadliest diseases with a jab. Blinding lights. DJs come together to bring performances like no other to the convenience of homes. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the United States. Republicans, despite disagreeing with Democrats on the debt crisis, have offered a short-term fix to the problem headed by Senator Mitch McConnell. Tonight, what could be a new short-term solution to the looming fiscal disaster? Top Republican Mitch McConnell offering Democrats a deal to allow the government to extend its ability to borrow money to pay its bills for another two months. We view that as a victory. We view it as a temporary victory, though, with more work to do. Democrats have been blasting Republicans for refusing to join them to raise the debt limit that covers past spending by both parties, an effort Democrats say has always been bipartisan. President Biden earlier today accusing Republicans of playing a dangerous game. It doesn't have to be this way. My Republican friends need to stop playing Russian roulette with the U.S. economy. But Republicans argue Democrats have rushed to pass trillions of dollars in new spending without GOP support. So Democrats, they say, should raise the debt ceiling on their own and that their offer gives them more time to do it. I'm not going to support uh, th this, uh, uh, this craziness that my President Biden and his new woke left friends are trying to... Uh, to ram down the American people's throat. The debt ceiling is effectively the country's credit card limit, now set at just above $28 trillion. If it is not raised before October 18th, according to the Treasury Department, the U.S. will run out of cash and for the first time ever, default on its bills. We would likely experience a recession. Millions of jobs would be lost and the pain would endure well past the resolution of the crisis. The impact affecting most Americans, from plunging stock markets to rising credit card and mortgage rates. Nearly 50 million seniors could stop receiving Social Security checks, members of the military could go unpaid, and child tax credits for millions of families could be delayed. A federal judge temporarily blocked a near-total ban on abortion in Texas, the toughest such law in the United States, in a challenge brought by President Joe Biden's administration after the U.S. Supreme Court had allowed it to go into effect. For more details, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent, Nicola Sena Ratna, joining us from New York in the United States. Nicola. Yes, Shanali. The action by U.S. District Judge Robert Pickman in Austin prevents the state from enforcing the Republican backed law which prohibits women from obtaining an abortion after six weeks of pregnancy while legitimation over its legitimacy continues. The case is part of a fierce legal battle over abortion access in the United States with numerous states pursuing restrictions. The Biden's Justice Department sued Texas on September 9th and sought a temporary injunction against the law, arguing during an October 1st hearing that the measure violates the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Supreme Court on September 1st let the law take into effect in a 5 to 4 power by consecutive justice. At six weeks of pregnancy, many women do not know that they are pregnant. The law makes no exception for pregnancies caused by rape or incest. It also lets ordinary citizens enforce the ban, rewarding them at least $10,000 if they successfully sue anyone who provides an abortion after fetal cardiac activity is detected. Critics of the law have said that this provision enables people to act as an anti-abortion bounty hunters. Texas Governor Greg Abbott, a Republican, has defended the legality of the state's abortion of law, with his office saying in a statement, the most precious freedom is life itself. Pittman heard about three hours of arguments of the Justice Department's request of Justice Department Attorney Britton Norm. 
called a law an unprecedented scheme of digital justice that must be struck down. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidhar World News Special Correspondent Nicola Sena Ratner reporting from New York in the United States. The U.S. had made a decision to reopen a consulate in East Jerusalem to allow democratic processes for Palestinians, which has caused much anger in Israel. Plans to reopen an American consulate in East Jerusalem serving Palestinians have prompted pushback from the Israeli government. The administration of U.S. President Joe Biden says it wants to reopen the consulate to repair relations with the Palestinians after it was closed by then-President Donald Trump. But right-wing Israeli lawmaker Nir Barkat has proposed a bill that would outlaw the planned reopening, which he said would undermine Israel's claim to Jerusalem. And we must do everything we can to maintain the unity of the city of Jerusalem. Such a move impedes and can actually damage, strategically damage, the relationship between Israel and the United States. Barkat was mayor of Jerusalem when Trump broke with decades of U.S. policy and moved the embassy there from Tel Aviv. The move exhilarated Israel's right-wing government but provoked violent clashes between Palestinians and Israeli troops. A year later, the U.S. shuttered the East Jerusalem consulate, prompting Palestinian negotiator Saeb Erekat to say this. This is a day of infamy for American diplomacy. Israel's new unity government, led by Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, also opposes the reopening of the consulate, potentially boosting the chances of passage for Barkat's legislation. Never did we give anybody consent to open up a diplomatic mission uh, for Palestinians in the city of Jerusalem. U.S. officials have been largely reticent on the issue, saying only that the reopening process remains in effect. Asked whether precedent existed in U.S. diplomacy for opening a mission over objections of a host country, the State Department's Office of the Historian declined to comment. European Union leaders failed to overcome divisions over whether to develop an independent defense force despite anger and the chaotic withdrawal with the Western forces from Afghanistan and new impetus from France after it excluded from the U.S. geostrategic pact. The chaotic withdrawal of Western forces from Afghanistan is still troubling for many U.S. allies. And at a summit of European Union leaders this week, the problem has been laid bare. The EU is divided over the bloc's reliance on the United States for its defence strategy. Leaders meeting over dinner in Slovenia on Tuesday split rather predictably into eastern states fearful of Russia who want to strengthen Europe within NATO and those led by Germany, Italy, Spain and France who want a more robust EU capability. Before the closed-door meetings in Bordeaux Castle, French President Emmanuel Macron told reporters that the 27-nation bloc must do more to manage crises on its borders and to be responsible for its own security. He had questioned the reliability of the US's protection of Europe prior to last month's dispute over an Indo-Pacific pact, which has added fuel to the fire. It is important that Europe parle d'une voix. The diplomatic crisis was triggered after the United States negotiated a military accord in secret, known as AUKUS, tightening its military cooperation with Australia and Britain to counter China, but excluding France. The EU leaders are also being joined by six Balkan leaders, part of the bloc's decades-long strategy to create a ring of friends from southeastern Europe to North Africa. Proponents of a stronger EU defence say the warnings have been many, including Washington's so-called pivot to Asia during the Obama administration, Britain's departure from the bloc, and the Trump administration's America First policies. But despite progress on building a common defence fund to develop weapons together, the EU has yet to deploy its battalion-sized battle groups in a crisis. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff will strengthen deterrence strategies against North Korea's continuous missile threats. Seoul's foreign minister called on the regime to have immediate talks to carry out the cross-border military agreement. Seoul will further beef up its deterrence strategies against North Korea's nuclear missile threats while strengthening its attack and missile defense capabilities. In a report for the annual parliamentary audit on Wednesday, South Korea's Joint Chief of Staff said the North continues to bolster its nuclear and missile capabilities. In order to draw up new strategies against the threats, the JCS said the military is reassessing the security situation on the Korean Peninsula to take into consideration the results of the regime's party congress in January and U.S.-China tensions. 
As a part of its five-year plan, Pyongyang test-fired four missile launches just last month, including a newly developed anti-aircraft missile. Also on Wednesday, South Korea's first vice foreign minister Choi jong gun urged the North to return to dialogue immediately to carry out the inter-Korean military agreement. Regarding Seoul's offer to declare an end of war with Pyongyang, Choi highlighted at a forum that the two Koreas need to build a future order for peace on the peninsula, starting with their declaration. Choi then noted it is a time for the two sides to ask and answer one another through open dialogue. While the North has remained unresponsive to Washington's overtures, a former U.S. intelligence official said on Tuesday that the North is likely waiting to hear from the U.S. that it's committed to an action-for-action -action approach toward the North's complete denuclearization. Noting that the North was still in a, quote, low-key, Andrew Kim, former founding director of the CIA's Korea Mission Center, said Pyongyang is expected to focus on domestic politics in South Korea for the next few months, ahead of South Korea's presidential election set to take place in March. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Japan has seen a chance of governments, albeit from the same party as the Liberal Democratic Party's new leader, Fumio Kishida, took reins and vowed to work even harder for the country. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Rasita Chandradasa, reporting from Tokyo in Japan. Rasita. Good evening, Shanali. Kishida Fumio became the 100th Japanese Prime Minister in a special parliamentarian session on Monday. And with that, he became the third uh, Liberal Democratic Prime Minister over the past three years after the sudden resignations of Abe Shinzo and uh, Suga Yoshihide. Kishida-san appointed his cabinet, a 20-member strong cabinet, uh, on the same day. And he also appointed the party leadership. Surprisingly, he appointed Amari-san as the next General Secretary. Uh, in Japanese politics, General Secretary is one of the most important positions that pretty much runs the party policies and also the party elections. And talking about the election, Kishida-san announced yesterday that he might dissolve the parliament on 19th and have the next general elections on 31st. The Japanese parliament is expected to uh, cease, expire on next month. And uh, post-World War, there was only one instant uh, within the 70 years that the parliament had it full four years. The, usually, the prime minister dissolved parliaments to, for snap elections to benefit from their higher uh, polling rates or to avoid issues. And the Kishida-san, obviously as the new prime minister, he's running his popularity high. He had about 60% uh, uh, favoring rate in the recent poll and he's no doubt going to utilize uh, uh, his, uh, what do you call, his uh, new policies in a general election. So the 31st election is probably will be announced soon and the, the ruling Liberal Democrat will have to face a tough one. Over the past seven years, Abe Shinzo has led them to five consecutive election victories with the both lower house, which is called Diet, and the upper house. But the recent polling says the LDP's popularity is waning and with all the issues they had, all the controversies, and all the, uh, uh, some of the controversial issues that both Abe-san and the Suga-san has to face, even the, uh, the vaccination issues and the corona control, would make the next election very interesting. Over to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidara Nobel News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandra Dasa reporting from Tokyo in Japan. We have some good news for you. The World Health Organization said the only approved vaccine against malaria should be widely given to African children, potentially marking a major advance against the disease that kills hundreds of thousands of people annually. This vaccine is a gift to the world, but its value will be felt most in Africa. The World Health Organization on Wednesday recommended the first approved vaccine for malaria should be widely given to African children potentially marking a major advance against a deadly disease. Using this vaccine in addition to existing tools to prevent malaria could save tens of thousands of young lives each year. The WHO estimates malaria killed 386,000 Africans in 2019. 
2.3 million doses of the vaccine Mosquirix, developed by British drug maker GlaxoSmithKline, have been given to infants in Ghana, Kenya and Malawi since 2019 in a large-scale pilot program. That program followed a decade of clinical trials in seven African countries. The WHO says 94 percent of malaria cases and deaths occur in Africa, a continent of 1.3 billion people. The preventable disease is caused by parasites transmitted to people by the bites of infected mosquitoes. The vaccine's effectiveness at preventing severe cases of malaria in children is only around 30 percent, but so far it is the only approved vaccine. Another vaccine against malaria developed by scientists at Britain's University of Oxford showed up to 77 percent efficacy in a recent study, but it is still in the trial stages. Experts say the challenge now will be finding funding for production and distribution of the vaccine to some of the world's poorest countries. Now on to the updates of the COVID crisis. Sweden has halted the Moderna vaccine rollout for the younger population among alarming reports of dangerous side effects of the jab, which may lead to severe complications. The Swedish health agency on Wednesday said the country is suspending the use of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine for people born in 1991 and later. That announcement came after reports of possible rare side effects among youths and young adults, such as myocarditis and inflammation of the heart muscle, which the Mayo Clinic says can include symptoms that resemble a heart attack. In a statement, the health agency said the connection is especially clear when it comes to Moderna's vaccine spike facts, especially after the second dose. It added that the risk of being affected was very small. The health agency now recommended the Comirnaty vaccine from Visa biontech instead. Some 81,000 people born in 1991 or later had received a first Moderna shot. They would not be getting a second jab. Earlier this week, the Swedish health agency said people aged 12 to 15 would only get the Visa biontech vaccine. The European Medicines Agency approved the use of Comirnaty in May while Spikevax was given the nod for children over 12 in July. While it's not yet been implemented, the so-called vaccine pass that restricts unvaccinated people from entering public facilities had led to a heated debate among South Koreans. Some people believe it's necessary for the return of the pre-pandemic life, but others strongly oppose, saying that it violates people's rights. As infections continue to rise among those unvaccinated or partially vaccinated, South Korea is reviewing a new system that only allows vaccinated people access to certain places such as movie theaters and museums. The so-called vaccine pass has not been introduced yet, but it's still been met with much controversy. According to a survey commissioned by a local news agency, 64.4% of respondents were in favor of the introduction of a vaccine pass, while 29% were against the idea. Only 6.6% said they did not know or didn't have an opinion about the matter. Those who support the system say it has several benefits. If introduced, I think more people will feel the need to get vaccinated. I also think people will be able to move around freely. Other countries are also gradually introducing similar systems, so I think it will be OK if we have it in our country since many are getting vaccinated. However, some argue that vaccination is a matter of choice, so unvaccinated people should not be penalized in this way. They fear that if the system is implemented, it will discriminate against those who have not been vaccinated. While experts understand that such policies might be necessary to bring life back to normal, they also stress that the government should look into ways to avoid infringing on the rights of unvaccinated people. Health officials have said that the vaccine pass is not intended to discriminate or unfairly disadvantage those who have not been vaccinated. They vow to thoroughly review the system so that unvaccinated people will not experience discomfort. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 
Former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott stated he was in Taiwan to help end its worldwide isolation, providing his assistance to the democratically run island even in the face of what he referred to as China's challenges. At least 20 people have been killed and more than 200 injured after a magnitude 5.7 earthquake struck close to Hanai, a town in Pakistan. Colombia marks 200 years of its constitution with President Ivan Duke using the opportunity to herald the country for providing opportunities to migrants fleeing poverty and violence. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and Israeli President Isaac Herzog attended evening and official commemoration ceremony for the victims of Babin Yar, one of the biggest single massacres of Jews during the Holocaust. And finally tonight, the city of Seoul will be hosting the World DJ Festival this coming weekend. Though not in person because of the pandemic, rather it will come to the viewers online using cutting-edge virtual reality and so-called extended reality. It runs from Saturday to Monday from stages at... Zhangzhou Arena. The venue will be streamed using 360-degree VR cameras so you can get close-up, ultra-realistic views of the show. There will be 44 South Korean DJs performing, including the influential EDM artist Jun Koko and the popular DJ Soda. On the festival dates, it will air on YouTube. Virtual reality is becoming of increasing significance in the coming years as many more events globally have taken to its platform to host never-before-experienced entertainment and this concert will be celebrating years of culmination of the technology. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Anuradhi will be back tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.